Hi, I'm Robbie. I'm here from San Diego, and I have a question that I'm sure many of us share. I'm ET Jack 2 for about three years diagnosed, although I'm sure I've had it for about seven or eight years. My question is um, Hydrea versus Pegasus. In the absence of contraindications um, to Pegasus, such as autoimmune disease or depression, um, why is Pegasus not the first line of treatment, given that it's immune therapy versus cytotoxic therapy? So, so just to be clear, so essential thrombocythemia and polycythemia vera are chronic diseases in which the goals initially are to try to reduce the risk of thrombosis like we talked about. And then the longer term goal is hopefully trying to prevent the disease progression. Right now, there is data that would suggest that, particularly in ET, that hydroxyurea achieves one of those goals, which, which is reduction in risk of thrombosis. However, there's a concern, which uh, you know, is valid, that because it's a chemotherapeutic, as you pointed out, it is a drug that may actually promote or enhance the ability for the disease to progress into an acute leukemia or a myelodysplastic syndrome and, and actually do perhaps more harm than good over a longer period of time. I will point out that that's not been act actually shown clearly in studies, but that's a, that's a fear that's validated in the community. Interferon is a immune modulating drug. It has pleiotropic effects. It, it affects many different aspects uh, in the bone marrow. And one of the effects of the drug um, that's been shown in laboratory investigation is that it can actually induce um, a degree of quiescence or quietness of the stem cell, of the malignant stem cell. So these are all malignancies of a hematopoietic stem cell population, a stem cell that resides, or a population of cells that reside in your bone marrow at a very small frequency that give rise inappropriately to a clone of cells that then likely compromise normal blood cell development. Pegasus is thought to work at that level and to allow for reversion to more normal hematopoiesis, more normal blood cell development. Sounds very intriguing, sounds very attractive, and in the lab there's evidence to back that. Whereas the thought process is with hydroxyurea, nonspecific chemotherapeutic, you're not necessarily going to get that effect. The problem that lies right now, at least in my mind, is that if you look at data at hand from the MPDRC, at one year there's no clear difference between those two drugs. But again, I will stress that's a Early, early time point. Ropec and Furin has some latter data that they've presented at two years, which would start to show that the curves may be uh, changed and that you start to see the, the latter effects of Ropec and Furin that you don't see with hydroxyurea early on. Um, so what I'm getting at is right now there's really no, there's no, although hydroxyurea is the standard of care because whether you're in Europe um, or the U.S., that's typically the drug that's chosen. Um, it, it's not clear that one drug is superior over the other, but there are advantages to one versus the other. Hydroxyurea is oral, interferon is injectable. Uh, interferon is a biologic, so I think a lot of the concern that it may promote disease progression is not really um, a concern as people have with hydroxyurea. Um, and there is data from phase two studies um, out of Europe and, and even the U.S. that shows that uh, Pegasus in particular, uh, but Ropec interferon as well, can induce molecular remissions. And that is gratifying because in my talk I talked about biomarkers, and that's a biomarker. It's a blood test. We think, we think that it predicts or tells us that we're modifying the course of the disease. Because we can't, if there were hundreds of thousands of um, ET patients readily available at our disposal that we can, you know, do large trials and get quicker information, um, then, then that would be able to back up some of the things that we do. But we don't have that luxury. So we use biomarkers sometimes to give an early sense of whether we're accomplishing a goal, like disease course modification. So inducing a molecular emission would suggest that, that that's what we're doing. Um, and interferon has been able to show to do that. So there are, you know, there are, depending on the patient and the circumstances, there are advantages to one over the other. I don't know that there's, in every case, a clear winner. For some patients, it may be hydroxyurea. Other patients may be interferon. For other patients, it may be a clinical trial. For other patients, it may be busulfan. A negrolide is a drug that's been historically used a long time ago and has even made a comeback for some patients. Not always well tolerated by every patient, but no drug is. Um, just like in some patients, you can have neuropathy with some of these JAK2 inhibitors, but that's not a common um, complaint and, you know, it's not, not a reason not to use it in the appropriate setting. So I think the other thing is that you have to think historically, hyd the hydrea was one of the, was a sort of a lower dose comparator to some of the other higher dose chemotherapies that were looked at 30 or 40 years ago. So the data accumulated for hydrea, interferon, you know, was thought to be very symptomatic. Now it's in this formulation called Pegasus. It's less symptomatic. So I think just the historical ability to accumulate data has favored hydrea.
It is in the NCCN guidelines now that you can consider interferon for upfront therapy in select patients. So I use that when I'm arguing with insurance companies to cover Pegasus, in particular for people in their younger years. Um, and I've been generally successful. I think as a community, we need to keep interferon available. Um, and so that's gonna mean making sure that, you know, if, if, if you have the opportunity to advocate for a large number of drugs in these diseases do, because we need to keep a large selection available until we have better dr drugs. So the, the question is a good one, and perhaps to explain for folks a little bit, what is the difference between uh, an approved therapy, uh, an available therapy, and where your choice kind of falls in the mix? So one, FDA approval of a therapy typically involves the approval of a drug for a very specific type of patient uh, in a situation. Now, many of the therapies that we use to treat both blood cancers MPNs and other diseases are not are approved, but not necessarily for all of the reasons we use them. I think it's about 50% uh, of the therapies we use actually have an on indication for for what we for what we receive. So one, is it available? Two, uh, is it an appropriate option? In the setting of MPNs, I'd say interferon in terms of the guidelines in the U.S which come from a group called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines, of which many of us participated. You know, it's one of several options, of which I think what the information that John shared, you know, helps to show that interferon is, is an option. Now, I think options, when you have several options, are really a discussion between you and your physician uh, in terms of what those options are. Some, some things are options, some things are, are not options. So I described for folks, medicine is both art and science. The science are what's within that group of options. If we wanna use a drug that's used in breast cancer without any information, that's, that's really not an option. There's no proof for that. Uh, we don't know whether that is appropriate. If one of us wrote for that, we could be held really at fault for giving a medicine that was unreasonable. But medicines that were, are within that group that's really the art of medicine, in which patient is the right medicine appropriate. A and obviously, you know, you as an individual have an important stake in that discussion, you know, regarding what the options are. So I think in, for essential thrombocytemia, you want to be very careful not to get emotionally involved in, in these drugs. I mean, and uh, focus on something you've read that might be a side effect that might be long term and never appear. And at the same time, you're, with your average survival being the same as the rest of the population, you want to be sure that your quality of life is good and that the cost is not something uh, that's going to be damaging to you in terms of co-pays. Um, interferon, I think, is very useful, but I think you have to be very careful. Most studies screen people very carefully for depression and other problems that you can have with the drug, and uh, everybody who has used the drug has had uh, at various times pretty negative experience in individual patients and it's not entirely predictable. So I think it's a, it's a useful drug, but you don't want to pick the drug because you think in the back of your mind that it's a biologic, therefore it must be better. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. You want to look at the data and look at long-term benefit and quality of life, cost, of, cost for you, and all of those things go in. So it's an individual decision that you want to make carefully, but you don't, you don't want to get caught up in this, I read this thing and I, it scares me. You, you really want to sit down and, and think through it carefully and not get caught up in, the, well, in this I, thing. Am I wrong to, in the research that I have read that says, you know, if you're on high three for 20 years, you have a 20% chance of AML. If you're on high three for 30 years, you have a 30% chance of AML. Whereas when I don't read that with the biologics and I see that it actually reduces the allele burden, that in my mind might make 
Well, maybe other people can comment it, but I've never seen that data of, of uh, hydrea causing. And I think, as it was mentioned, there's no data to establish that it is associated with an increased risk. I think those data are, are, are probably much more negative than our, what we have as experienced search. Uh, this is a really good discussion. Thank you for bringing this up. Um, the percentages are not really important. Is it 18 or is it 22? The question is whether hydria really, in our uh, opinion, contributes uh, based on the data available to that uh, increased risk of acute myeloleukemia. And the data is not conclusive. What is your risk of having acute myeloleukemia or patient's risk by doing nothing? There is a risk that the disease evolves on its own. So we are not able to quantify the risk of additional percentage that would hydroxyurea add to underlying risk of transformation. And that has been since 1970s, uh, since, since that time that we don't have that information. And more modern studies actually with thousands of patients, particularly in Europe, suggest that hydria, if there is any additional risk to underlying risk from the disease, it's very minimal. That's why people feel comfortable using hydroxyurea. But the other aspect that is comp continuously being brought up is the, the molecular response. Nobody has shown, as John has uh, outlined already, that the molecular response means anything long term for the patients with ET or PV. And that has to be taken into, together with our inability to deliver interferon for much longer than five years on average. Studies so far have shown that interferon, long-acting interferon, can only be given on average five years. So you are, let's say, 45, and you have a need for cytoreductive therapy, and my first choice will be interferon, because you're younger, I don't want you to take hydroxyurea for the next 40 years because I'm worried about the skin cancer, which has been proven to be a side effect, right? Squamous cell carcinoma. I'm less worried about acute myeloleukemia, but it is in my mind, and the guidelines suggest to try to avoid hydroxyurea if you are in 40s, for example. So I would use interferon, but I know that the chance of you being on interferon for, for 40 years is close to zero. Why? Because the experience is that toxicities still happen. The dropout rate is about five, to 10% a year, even on a long-acting interference. The progression still happens, even if you have a molecular response, even if your bone marrow normalizes, you still may have a need for therapy. It does not mean cure. That's the key here. We are thinking that molecular response means a cure, and we don't have that evidence at all. It's the biologic marker. That's all it is for now. We treat patients to decrease risk of thrombosis, not to decrease the jack to a little burden, or to eliminate Jack to a little burden. We don't know really what this means. And it's compounded, unfortunately, with our inability to deliver interferon for 40 years. Maybe the new ones will, but not the current ones. So there are multiple layers here, as you can see. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm a PV patient, and um, I have two questions. Um, I've had PV, I was diagnosed in 2008. Uh, but I believe I've had markers since the late 90s because I'm a pack rat with my medical records. And I had elevated platelets uh, in the late 90s and uh, my, slightly elevated. My doctor ordered a biopsy and it showed nothing. And then I had two thrombotic events, uh, one in my 20s and one in my 30s. Um, and the second one uh, determined my diagnosis. So my my comment with that, I have a comment and a question first, is I want to thank you all because if it wasn't for that thrombotic event in 2008 uh, with a smart doctor that said, let's test for genetic testing for JAK2, I, I probably wouldn't be here. So um, thank you for all the work that you do. Yeah, it's, you. it's really fantastic. <laughs> And it's true, um, you know, I was dismissed easily. You know, I was 29 with my first uh, coronary artery blockage. Uh, you know, I worked out a lot, and my second one was um, hepatic vein. And uh, it was just remarkable. So my question is, since 2008, I was on Hydrea for about six months, and I was still young at the time, and um, my doctor opted to take me off because of my age. And 
recently, 10 years later, I went back on hydroxyurea because I was getting more uh, bone pain and fatigue. The hydroxyurea was a miracle. It, it went away immediately, uh, but I had side effects. So how do you determine, this is my question, what is the sweet spot? Is there a sweet spot where there's markers? Because I've heard there's markers that you can see in blood test results now where you can see there's a slight progression or something that you can look for that maybe that's a sweet spot where you should start to be on medication. So it, it's an excellent question, and thank you very much for, for, for sharing the difficulties that you've had. You know, progression in these diseases is, is a key issue. As you've got that as a theme really across the talks, you know, for most individuals, if we prevent blood clots, the real risk is the risk of progression. First, the good news, as, as Dr. Lyons was alluding to, not everyone progresses. So, I mean, they, they, that is important good news. Uh, and probably in each of the groups, either with time with the disease or other things that, that interfere in life, clearly not everyone progresses. But sadly, some individuals do. So the interest in trying to figure out why do people progress, how can we measure it, and how can we stop progression are become very important. Progression is a mix of things. As we evaluate for progression, one, it can include a change in bone marrow findings. Not alone, if you only have change in bone marrow findings, that doesn't necessarily mean your disease has progressed, but it may be one sign. Two, and this is a very important part, progression typically has a noticeable change in how the disease is affecting you. The blood counts go from being very high to no longer being high or being low. The symptoms are worse, and as we'll talk a little bit after lunch about symptoms, the symptoms might be a little different. There are some symptoms such as inadvertent weight loss, which as we all know just doesn't happen, uh, you know, uh, uh, certainly on its own. Uh, but if that occurs, you know, that raises my eyebrow and goes, you know, nobody loses 15 pounds without trying. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, and if you found that secret, certainly tell me. You know, so, so that's, so that fever, bone pain, those symptoms give me concern as something different. Where other symptoms, such as fatigue or itching, might be present anywhere along the course. The spleen can be a, a sign of change that can enlarge with progression. Not always, but frequently is the case. And then finally, there's these parts. Are there any molecular markers or surrogate markers that clearly tell us that we're progressing? At the moment, that is an evolving science. And maybe I'll ask that Jason to, to, to make a comment, as well as someone who studies these to a great degree. The, the information regarding the genetics is very interesting, but it's very much evolving. It's like we have a jigsaw puzzle with, you know, it's a 500-piece puzzle but we've got about 200 pieces on the board. You know, so we could see some shapes, we can see some suggestions, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of missing pieces. But fortunately, there are many very smart scientists working uh, here, working uh, around the country, working in various labs around the world, trying to figure out this issue of progression. Jason, any comments really in terms of subtle hints of molecular markers and progression? So I would just say that I agree with everything about what Ruben said. I would not use molecular markers themselves to make any major treatment changes. So I, I look at all the things that Ruben indicated. I look at the blood counts. As someone who has PV and requiring frequent phlebotomy, needing less phlebotomy, are they becoming more anemic? Are their platelets going down? Are they more symptomatic? Is their spleen increasing in size? So we get these molecular panels and we come back with certain types of mutations. But if a, if a patient is stable, I discuss what the mutation or mutations mean, but if they're feeling great and they're stable on a therapy or if they are not on a therapy, I don't add a therapy. So I, you need to make sure that you put everything in context and don't overreact to the finding of a mutation. You know, the, the, I see plenty of patients uh, on interferon therapy and they're so focused on what their JAK2 mutation is 
allele burden is. And I, I see individuals who, if their mutation level is 31% and it goes up to 37%, they're getting anxious. Or if it's 31% and it goes down to 24%, they're screaming with joy. We have to be careful to avoid um, irrational exuberance about a change in the molecular level of uh, five or 10 points or even 30 points or if it gets worse if someone is otherwise clinically stable. So we have to put all those issues in context. So several speakers though have alluded to the fact that if, uh, if an individual has intermediate risk disease and they have a higher risk mutation, um, that is something that one could put into the decision mix in terms of thinking about the timing of transplant. So if someone has a high risk mutation and maybe their spleen is starting to grow or they're becoming more symptomatic, these are all factors that we take into consideration to decide whether should we start thinking about transplant, moving to it now, three months, six months, a year, and then we can continually reevaluate their clinical symptoms or whether new mutations have popped up. Another part of what I do and so in somebody when I see somebody with PV and real change in their symptoms so a real transition I usually do think about a bone marrow biopsy at that time and the reason is is because there's not only molecular studies but cytogenetics which are a little bit um, sort of a little duller way to look at it if I see new changes in the cytogenetics that's another piece of information that I put in the puzzle to think about are things becoming more like myelofibrosis than PV Great. Well, we'll do one more question before lunch. Yes, my name is Warren Thomas. Uh, this is outside of my field. I'm a private equity guy, but my wife has uh, myelofibrosis, and she has progressed from a diagnosis of polycythemia vera in 2009 to now the early stage of myelofibrosis. And we have what we call a two-stage strategy, right? One is 1A, the other is 1B. It's not 1-2, but 1A, 1-2. And it's been talked about here today, the importance of treating the symptoms, trying to control <clears throat> the progression of disease. And so we want to give my beautiful wife here uh, the best quality of life possible while we're trying to find uh, the collective we. And I really am impressed with what has been done with the scientists and the researchers and the commitment of this group <clears throat> with respect to the spectrum of diseases in MPN and so on. But um, in the 1A, while we're working on the 1B, which is to try and find a cure or some way at least to stop the progression of the disease because we've lived it firsthand, is, um, is whether, and this may be an area that the panel fears to tread because it is not specifically FDA approved. And that is that um, I'd be interested in your comments on stem cell therapy, and in particular, while we're trying to, trying, trying to treat the symptoms, this gal was, a, was an athlete, long distance runner and so on. I was pushing her around in a wheelchair last year. And so she has had DVT, her valves are virtually destroyed, irreparably destroyed and so on. She has nearly daily fevers, night sweats, on and on and on, right? Swollen ankles and so on. Someday she can't walk. And so I have, as is my nature, I have passionately looked into what the options and alternatives are to, to, to deal with 1A in terms of, of, of quality of life, right? 1A. And so I've looked into the stem cell therapy, and in particular, the mesenchymal cells, which, as you know, I mean, have secrete the exosomes, and it appears to have some efficacy in treating the vascular system. And so I'd be interested in knowing kind of what the panel's uh, thoughts are about this non-FDA approved, it's not like it's not being done, but non-FDA approved strategy on uh, cellular therapy. Sure. So, so well, let me ask Dr. Palmer, perhaps just to explain for the group uh, a little bit the subtle difference in what the question is. Because usually when we speak of stem cell therapy in the setting of a disease like myelofibrosis, we're talking about the blood stem cells that come from the bone marrow to repopulate the bone marrow cells that make red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. What you're speaking of, sir, is, is an experimental therapy where they're looking at different stem cells that can repopulate uh, lining of blood vessels or muscle or other what they call kind of regenerative medicine therapies. So the two are, are, are quite distinct. But Gene, any thoughts? 
Well, uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells are kind of a, an interesting uh, group of cells. They've actually been explored quite a bit in bone marrow, the bone marrow transplant world, um, as they were felt to potentially provide a good treatment for graft-versus-host disease. Um, and unfortunately, at least in adults, it didn't really pan out, I think, and kids are still looking at it. Um, the use of, of different types of stem cells for different types of regenerative medicine is still very early on. I personally don't know of any studies looking at mesenchymal stem cells in myelofibrosis. I don't think it's totally a crazy idea because we do know that they have an immunomodulatory effect, so that might actually help with the symptoms. But again, I don't know of any specific therapies going on for that. I would say most certainly, you know, anytime we do not have an easy cure for an illness that is difficult, you know, the consideration of an appropriate clinical trial is very reasonable. I mean, I'd say if there were a clinical trial that, you know, was appropriate, in other words, they thought that it was for a group of individuals that might benefit, you know, based on, you know, your disease and parameters, then I think like any clinical trial, that would certainly be a consideration. One of the great things about being on a clinical trial is that as part of that participation, nowadays, most clinical trials do an extremely vigorous job of looking at symptoms. So you'll be screened with symptom surveys before and after, your, and you're also, as part of that trial, going to have be seen a little bit more frequently than you might not otherwise. As Dr. Versovsic and, and others have said, this is the best way to get the novel medicines that are combined. I mean, usually to be on a clinical trial, you have to exhaust what's already approved. But if those haven't been right for you, and you're still having symptoms or still having clinical complications, travel or ex looking into clinical trials is the best way to have a monitored, evaluated opportunity for something novel. So the question is whether there is any difference between what we call primary myelofibrosis that comes out of the blue and you are diagnosed with myelofibrosis from the get-go, or you develop myelofibrosis after ET or polycythemia vera. There is no evidence that the outcome is the same, uh, different, and there is no management difference between the two types. There are some prognostic scoring systems that uh, are being developed uh, that uh, may look at the characteristics of the patients whether there is a primary or secondary myelofibrosis in question for prognostication purposes in terms of defining who is a good candidate for the bone marrow transplant. That's why we use prognostication, right? And there appears to be some clinical differences. Patients with post-PV or post-PET myelofibrosis may have a high blood cell count or have some other molecular findings that are a little bit different, but it does not appear that the outcome that's the bottom line, right? The outcome is different or the management is different. Great question. Sure. I have uh, ET, right? <laughs> EMF, uh, progressed from ET. Had progressed from ET, evidently. And this past winter, I wasn't feeling well and I had a chest x-ray. And the uh, my doctor said it looked, you know, my lungs looked fine. He said, but the... Uh, Radiologists saw some spots on my vertebrae, and so they started. I had uh, CT scans and bone scans. They were looking to see if I had cancer somewhere else that had gone to my bones. <clears throat> and the radiologist said it's probably from MF, and I had not heard of MF causing osteosclerosis, I believe what they defined it as. But that's the first part of my question is that common? The second part is talking about the. Uh, 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 I'll think about it in a minute. Stem cell transplant, yeah. <laughs> Does it affect your, your memory? No. Uh, looking at all the symptoms you mentioned earlier, my spleen is enlarged and I have to get blood occasionally. And looking down that road for a bone marrow transplant, I have a sister that's a match, fortunately. And this osteosclerosis, is that something that I know it causes thickening of the bones and brittleness in the future? Is that one of the things I should look at? And, and trying to decide whether it's time for bone marrow transplant. Is that something that happens slowly along with all the other things, trying to put them all together? So th the answers to your questions are yes and no. So yes, osteosclerosis is a component of myelofibrosis. If you 
um, I, I tend to like to sit down with the hematopathologist and look at the, the bone marrows of my patients. And he, there's actually two, he and she often will point out the patients that have osteosclerosis. And it's a finding that to me seems subtle, but they're very good at, at describing pathologically under the microscope. But sometimes even, it's not uncommon for me to get a, a phone call or you see a report of our MF patients and they'll comment, um, whether it's a CT and MRI or even an X-ray, that there are changes that you know, are suggestive of something. We know that 90% of the time that's the myelofibrosis and that's signal intensity in the bone marrow. Um, but sometimes um, very um, astute radiologists will even pick up like osteosclerosis, if it's profound, on the, on the chest X-ray. It, it, to me, osteosclerosis is not an indication or a reason to more aggressively pursue bone marrow transplant. It really still relies and Dr. Palmer can give you the, the, the more comprehensive answer, but it really relies on your overall picture. And the, the you know, we score patients um, constantly to put them into these discrete, discrete groups, and that really helps um, create a risk-adapted approach to the treatment of myelofibrosis. And the patients who have higher risk disease are the ones that we tend to refer to Dr. Palmer to say, hey, can you evaluate this patient for transplant? Because those patients, the disease risk will outweigh the risk of the transplant. And as Dr. Palmer said before, there's a risk involved with transplant. So you don't take someone who has a lower risk myelofibrosis and necessarily subject them to a treatment that may outweigh that risk and, and cause more harm than good. Um, but osteosclerosis, um, although is a, a feature, an epiphenomena of the disease, just like bone marrow fibrosis is, um, and um, may give you some sense of the extent of the disease, it itself is not used to calculate risk or decide per se. It's more uh, multiple factors that are put together in a model. So I, I wouldn't urge you to necessarily pursue transplant for that reason, but to consider transplant, um, particularly if you have a sister who's a donor, which makes it attractive, to consider transplant in its totality based on your risk score and other features that you know we won't particularly describe. Uh, just, just one comment I would make, you know, uh, again, certainly agree that, you know, the majority of time uh, those sort of bone changes are from the myelofibrosis. However, it, it is important when you have an MPN to, to sadly realize it doesn't protect from having other illnesses. If life was fair, it clearly would. You know, you only got one thing. But, you know, there are times clearly, I think each of us have seen individuals sent to us, an individual who has an MPN and is having something worse that is thought to be related to the MPN but is not. So let's say they develop anemia, and then anemia is not always progressive myelofibrosis. It might be, again, that they're having a bleeding ulcer or a colon polyp or, or other things. So always good to keep the MPN in mind, but always good not to have blinders on that unfortunately, you know, as we age, common things being common, other things can clearly be uh, a factor, and taking care of your overall health is important. Another reason why it's probably important for you to all to have a good primary care doctor and not solely a hematologist. Other questions? Please. Okay. This is gonna go, there's two separate. When you did the study, when you did the study on depression mm -hmm. and um, you get on all these patient sites that are supportive or should be supportive, um, I think the depression comes in, and I've, I've heard her story, my story. I didn't start out with Dr. V. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up with Dr. V, and I'm very blessed to, but um, I think that patients start out angry, and I call it pissed off complacency syndrome and not depression, because until you get to a doctor that actually knows what the disease is or knows your frustrations, and can address them and has the accessibility. Like I can email Dr. V and he'll, I'll say, is this a concern? No, is this a concern? No, is this a concern? Yes, whatever. But patients with their primary care doctors don't have that um, accessibility. And when you have comor uh, comorbidities or whatever, several diseases, you can have that primary care doctor that doesn't address the PV part, your PV doctor don't address the other part. I don't think it's depression as, as, as much as it is frustration. Sure, th th that can clearly be a contributor. I mean, there, there are many parts in there, you know, and, and clearly these feelings sometimes clearly can include, you know, what we truly call organic depression, kind of a, a, an excess reaction, but clearly can just include, 
you know, frustration, anger, and again, are there other ways to work through that as well? And patients are relying on other patients to address their symptoms and not their doctors. Because, and like her and I, you start out with, oh, you're just, you just have inflammation. You just have inflammation. It can go on for years. And then you finally get to the PV doctor that you needed to be at or that, you know, myelofibrosis or whatever. But I think that a lot of these conferences are geared more toward patients. They need to be geared more toward some of the caregivers, like the medical teams. So you get an MPN patient, but you don't, also, you don't get um, the things that help you through the MPN. Like MD Anderson, I do. I get integrated medicine. You, can, you, know, you get all of that, but not everybody has that accessibility. And I guess that's... True. More of a point than a question. Sure. Well, the, uh, uh, very excellent comments. Absolutely. Other questions? Please, uh, over there on the side. Thank you. Well, I'm kind of a visitor here. I um, am learning about these diseases. They're new to me. My husband had multiple myeloma, so I'm more familiar with that. And that's part of my question. After listening to Dr. Palmer's talk on transplants, um, I'm wondering, you, you, you seem to use only allergenic transplants. And of course, with the myeloma, they used um, auto, um, you know, person's own um, stem cells. So I'm wondering, do you ever use those, or do you? Is why do you not? Well, that's a great question, because <laughs> um, obviously an auto transplant has far fewer toxicities over the long term as compared to an allo transplant. Um, inherently, the way that I, I kind of look at the reason to do allo is because if you replace the same stem cells, like if you give chemotherapy, because ultimately what you're doing with an auto transplant is you're really trying to give maximum doses of chemotherapy to fight an underlying malignancy, whether it be myeloma or lymphoma or, or whatever, and then you're actually giving back the stem cells to be stem cell rescue. And they call it a transplant, but it's more high-dose chemotherapy with a stem cell rescue because you're just basically allowing regular blood growing to reoccur. The problem is that if you, in myelofibrosis, is the problem goes all the way down to the stem cell. It really does go down to the hematopoietic stem cell. So if you don't figure out a way to get rid of that hematopoietic stem cell, you're not gonna fix the marrow um, with just chemotherapy. Because the chemotherapy, yeah, well, it will knock out maybe blasts or bad cells or something, but then you're putting the same stem cells in there that are going to, to grow up to have the same phenotype that makes you have myelofibrosis or makes you have polycythemia vera or something like that. So you really, you don't fix the problem. And in, in fact, you probably would end up potentially causing even a little bit, making it worse because you already have cytopenias with myelofibrosis, so then you add some chemotherapy on top of that, and, and I think it could cause quite a bit of toxicity. It'd be nice. I wish there was a way to do it. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Great. Uh, additional Hi. questions? Uh, it, in the back there. Hi. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, please. <laughs> um, I was wanting to ask, um, well, I, I was diagnosed with PV in 96, with MF in 2012. Uh, in 2012, I went to Dr. V. We, he did a bone marrow biopsy and showed that I had trisopy 8. And that was the first time I had a bone marrow that showed that. And my regular hematologist did one year or so later, same thing. Can that actually go away where you don't have trisopy 8 anymore? Or once you get it, do you always have it? Here, let, let's see. Let me, let me pick on Jason here. <laughs> so you're, you're <coughs> indicating trisomy 8, which is means instead of having two copies of chromosome 8, you have three copies of chromosome 8. This is an abnormality of an extra chromosome. It is not specific to myelofibrosis per se. We do see that as a chromosome abnormality in other types of uh, blood cancers. And generally speaking, um, it's not something that we typically see go away. Sometimes it's the level is very low and it fluctuates between being something real and maybe being an artifact of the uh, 
uh, tests that we look at the chromosomes with, but um, usually it's something that does persist. And generally we think a trisomy 8 in the context of myelofibrosis is not something that is particularly good or bad chromosome abnormality. It's kind of a neutral chromosome abnormality. Um, so at this point in time, you know, if your uh, disease were ever to progress uh, in the future, they may want to see whether you have more cells with that abnormality or whether other chromosome abnormalities develop, whether other mutations develop. So right now, I, I personally would not make too much of it except to say it's there and to focus on how you're doing clinically. You know, again, as Ruben had mentioned earlier, are your counts getting worse, is your spleen getting bigger, are your symptoms changing in any way? Roger, why don't we get your perspective? One, <laughs> one, when do you repeat a, a bone marrow? Uh, and, and would you say you or your colleagues uh, ever look at cytogenetics in the, in the peripheral blood? Well, first, you know, at least in, in, uh, outside of a study situation, we really don't repeat the bone marrow unless there's some indication that the disease is changing. Uh, its course and, or that you want to change treatment in a, in a manner that you, you think you need additional data. In terms of getting uh, uh, chromosome analysis in the peripheral blood, it can be done, but it's not as easy on the, as on the bone marrow. Depending on how many uh, immature cells are, are circulating, we certainly can do uh, genetic studies easily in the peripheral blood, next generation sequencing. And, and sometimes other fish, fish studies and so on. But it's usually not, we usually don't do chromosomes in the peripheral blood, but it can be done. It's not as sensitive. Um, so I, 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 my suspicion is that this is a matter of sensitivity rather than coming and going. Great. I think this is a very interesting discussion. Let's ex extend it a little bit more. <clears throat> so the one question with all the testing is why test? What's the information here that we are getting by repeating the test? If there was a two or three tests done already and it was always there, highly unlikely it's going to go away. We know it's not really important for the prognosis. And now to determine whether it's still there or not, you end up having problems with sensitivity, with problems with identifying pro proper sample. But the question is, even if you have it again, what does it mean? So I would not retest for it anymore, similar to not retesting the bone marrow unless there is something else uh, that would lead you to you need to that, that information there. But the other thing is uh, we are talking about the chromosomal abnormality is not going away. That is extraordinarily rare. The molecular testing, however, may I show you some molecular findings. You can do AT gene panel, 400 gene panel, and we know that you can find mutations uh, with very precise testing even if in a normal people, right? JAK2 mutation can be found in normal people that don't have a disease and that are elderly, and just like that on a sensitive test, and it may go away. Sometimes you just uh, find the cells that uh, acquire something in normal people and it goes away, and sometimes that's possibly applicable even in the patients. Not that always everything on the molecular panel stays there, and so there would be possibly a applicability of such a testing periodically every 6 to 12 months. But then you end up asking questions, who's going to pay for it, and what's the purpose of the test, what you're going to do about the result, that's all a research question. So it's less... Uh, uh, fixed with the molecular stuff, but it's more fixed with the cardiotherapy. Just one more comment about sensitivity and that you have to be very careful about sensitivity, which assay is being done and how many, how, how many repeats they're doing and whether or not the sensitivity is 2 percent or 10 percent or 0.1 percent, and each one of these is variable depending on how you set up the assay and what you're trying to accomplish. And so some of these times when you see a positive and then see a negative, they're actually exactly the same. It's just the way the assay's been performed. So uh, 
and, and that's one of the reasons you don't want to do these things unless you have a reason because you may get people very nervous about having an abnormality which is really of no clinical significance. Thank you. Um, well, actually, I have two questions. I hope it's okay. Um, I'm a caregiver, but I have a friend that has um, has ET, and it's progressed to um, myelofibrosis, and she's transfusion dependent. And she's also going through kidney failure, and so there's X Jade, but it's also very hard on the kidneys. Is there anything that you're seeing that could be helpful for that? Um, I wish I had a good answer to that. Um, no, there, so there is, uh, there are, I'm gonna forget the name of the, there is a new medicine that's better on the GI system, but I don't know the safety yet in the kidneys. Jadenu, yeah, I, it's the same, right? Yeah, so I've not used it in people who have kidney failure. I also haven't found that it, it's that much of a home run. It was initially, used in individuals with thalassemia um, and it, children with thalassemia, and they did a little bit better in terms of getting the iron out of the blood. Um, I haven't found, in my own practice and in the literature, I haven't seen many people get the iron out of the blood that overwhelmingly effectively with these chelating agents, which is what they're called. So, uh, you know, it's sort of an experience in other areas in myelodysplasia. I mean, they, they can, can be very effective in getting the iron levels down if you take adequate dosing. A lot of people don't use the right dose of these drugs, and sometimes they're not very well tolerated, although the JNU is better tolerated than the others. And I have used them in renal disease, but usually it's end-stage disease on dialysis, and that's not particularly effective because uh, it's renally excreted. So there's a... Uh, you you can use these agents, but uh, there's other ways to go around that too. Uh, you can sometimes stimulate red cell production in red in renal failure, and then phlebotomize people. So there's a couple of ways around it. One more comment: We were talking about the uh, significance or a need for repeating your bone marrows or cytogenetics or things like that. With every medication, we ask the same question. What's the purpose of uh, decreasing the iron in that particular case or any other case? When you get to the level where iron is very l high in patients with malofibrosis due to transfusions, overall outcome, unfortunately, of patients with malofibrosis is not very good. A benefit of uh, removing iron from the body of a patient possibly can be seen after many years of doing iron chelation therapy and unfortunately, in that case, that patient highly unlikely does not have that time. So you have to ask yourself a question, what's the risk and bond is the benefit of intervention that you want? Not just chasing the numbers, but ultimately the clinical benefit of the drug. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna come back one thing to a different, the other diagnosis, because this is different for myelofibrosis with uh, people with very advanced disease and myelodysplasia. Uh, where you have ex excess iron stores, and in fact, taking iron off, and even if the iron levels don't go down, there is uh, a demonstrated significant survival advantage. Now, whether or not that is uh, due to the drug or selection bias is unclear yet, but those are different situations. We usually don't use the uh, chelating agents in myelodysplasia unless patients have values of over 100 and you expect survival to be at least one or two years. Uh, so, so every disease has a different situation, and I agree that uh, you want to, don't want to use the drug unless you think that there's going to be a significant difference in outcome. And, but again, myelodysplasia is different than myelofibrosis in this situation. Okay. Well, my second question, I have a second question, and it's for Dr. Mesa. Uh, is, do you see CAR-T um, coming for PMF? Sure, this is an excellent question. So CAR-T uh, is a sort of therapy that you've probably heard about on the news in a variety of ways. It's described, it, what it does is it modifies T cells, one of the immune cells, 
to uh, attack different types of cancers. So it's, it's, it's a very exciting type of therapy, uh, and it's a therapy that's been shown to really be particularly helpful for certain specific diseases that at this moment still are distinct from MPNs, uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia, lymphomas, perhaps myeloma. Part of the reason for that is this is a different type of cells, uh, and when we form an immune treatment like that, it uh, works against specific cells and then takes them away. It helps to destroy those cells. In diseases like MPNs and other myeloid disorders, there is still a, uh, a, a challenge scientifically that the cells that are involved with the disease are too similar to the cells that you need to survive, which are the myeloid stem cells. So scientists have not yet been able to sort out how to use that type of approach in diseases like MPNs or MDS or acute leukemia. They can do it, but then it cleans out the bone marrow. So there are clinical trials looking at this, very aggressive. You have to think that this is a group of therapies that in terms of intensity are more on that bone marrow transplant level of intensity. But they are exciting. Like any technology, they evolve. Uh, and people clearly are looking experimentally, are there ways to be able to separate the good cells from the bad cells? Indeed, as we try to treat any of these sort of diseases, trying to separate the good from the bad is, is the key fundamental need. Uh, and in MPNs, the extra challenge is that the, the bad cells and the good cells, the good cells are crucial. Uh, so we have to be really careful to to protect those and not harm the good cells in the process.